Hey everybody, it's Devin Francis, also known as Leonard Meltzner. I got a cough still. And you're watching episode 179 of the Adventures in Odyssey podcast. We... what are we doing today, Victoria? Uh... we're gonna start reviewing... Wait. I just had to look it up while I was asking you the question. Uh, it's premiere season. No, ding, ding, wait. Ding, ding. Wait, I was going to say, wouldn't this be an episode review that we do the intros and outros for later? We don't have to. We already started, so. Okay, I was just thinking in case there's news, but whatever. Yeah, well, we can we can append it on the beginning if we need to. Uh, album 67's here. More than meets the eye. Yeah. This one is rightly dividing. Yeah, and? Something about dads. Man of the house. But it's not our father. Nope. It's like our father redux like uh -huh. they did in album 50. Yeah. Um, Man of the house. Yes. Rightly dividing. It's episode 874 written by Phil Waller. What happens in this episode, Victoria? I know you remember so well. You said you'd do the intro. Yeah, I can do it. Um, we have two plots in this one. First off, we have Lou. It's Lou, the girl from the toy, Luella. She's back. Um, she's still helping out at wit's end, periodically. And there's another kid whose name escapes me. Um, and he is being bullied, and he doesn't know what to do about it. And Lou is trying to give him helpful advice on how to deal with a bully. I love Lou so much. And basically, a sweetheart. she tries to instill the golden rule in him, but then he takes it and twists it around in, like, an attacking way, and then it doesn't work, obviously. Um, and then finally learns what he's supposed to do. On the other side of things... We have... Who wrote this episode again? Phil. Okay. On the other side of things, we have Camilla. She's playing soccer, which is a thing that Camilla does quite a bit. And she has been, like, Tim Tebow and reading psalms to her teams and praying before they play their games. They're like war psalms, though. And Wilson's like, oh, that's cool and stuff. And then he finds out that Camilla has actually been reading, like, attack prayers um, and praying down, like, death and destruction on the enemy team. And so he basically tries to give her a bit of perspective on how sports are not reasonable cause to be praying, like, for the, the death and injury and destruction of the other team, and gives her a little perspective on, like, the nature of the uh, importance of things. When she meets a young uh, blind girl... He's moving to Odyssey, whose sister plays on one of their opposing teams, and this girl talks, who has Sarah in the episode as well, um, talks about how she is going to be getting cataract surgery, cataract transplants soon after basically spending her whole life, I believe, right? Not yeah. Not being able to see, basically being legally blind. Because it's the same deal as Sarah. Yeah. Um, so... She's in a couple months, she's finally been scheduled for cataract transplants, but it's crazy. And it was messing me up to think about too. It's scheduled months off, but the cataracts are only viable for like a week after the death of the donor. And the donor also has to be someone who is fairly young, which means that it's almost always going to be like an unexpected, sudden, traumatic, violent death and that it has not happened yet which means she is scheduled at a certain time to get organs from someone who has not yet died, and that person is still alive and out there somewhere, not knowing that they're going to die between now and the next couple months in some awful way that will result in her being able to get her transplant. Is it like the entire eye? It's just the cataract, so it's just the front. It's like, does, would the eye color change? No, it's, you're not taking the iris. It's the part in front of that, just the clear part on the very front of the eye. Okay. 
you know, like how how Gidget's eyes like went all cloudy in front and stuff. That's the part. So it's like the clear layer that's in front of everything that you can actually see. Okay. So yes, Lou, she's back. Uh, the show is just really suddenly bringing back kids I did not think we would ever see again, which has continued on the chain from that episode, The Toy, because that was the episode that brought back Ed Washington to us. Um, so the, the common theme of the episode is basically people, like, taking scripture and twisting it to use it in a way, like, trying to justify it as a way to attack people and inspire other people to like you know i don't know about you but i laughed really hard when i first heard camilla's prayer oh it was great yeah like um, it was really i was like this is horrible but it's so funny. but it's like it's great because oh i could load there's like there's so much commentary so much like relevant stuff about the world today about Camilla not seeing anything wrong with using scripture as a tool to pray against and attack people that she sees as her enemies and thinking that it's perfectly fine because she's pulling quotes from scripture. So clearly God wants her to be calling down divine judgments on, you know, the people that she decides are against her and using scripture as a tool to incite and justify those actions against people. I was like, that is... Uh, very relevant. It also ties immediately back to what we were just talking about in Bad Company, about like the Mr. Grayson in the Bible study talking about like how, you know, if you're just pulling from scripture without context, you can make it mean anything that you want it to mean. Man, it's almost like this is, this is a real thing in our lives that just like continues from episode to episode and the episodes are like interconnected or something like yeah. that. I guess we got to talk about Richard now for an hour, connecting even more. Yeah. Um, so with Lou, and I'm sorry, I do not remember, and I don't know if I wrote down the name of this other it's character. Fine. I can look it up. We um, can keep talking. Thank you. With both him and Lou. I had to look up this episode's plot anyway. I already have the thing open. I'm glad that we're continually getting more neurodivergent and disabled characters in the show. Is it Hugo? No. Or Mickey? No. Oh. Wait, Luella, Wilson, Luella, Sarah, Sarah, Mickey, Coach, Cramden, Hugo. That's that's all it says. You're missing him because Mickey was the bully and Hugo was like the bigger bully. Underneath actor, all it says for Hugo is the number eight. I don't know what that means, but it's very cryptic and I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad we're getting more, like, I feel like we have a long gap without anyone who's more than a one-off in terms of neurodivergent characters. So I'm really like that we have Lou here. Hope that she stays around. Um, and it's clear that the other the guy that she was talking to in this episode is also neurodivergent in some way. I don't know exactly in what way. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest thing for this episode to me uh, was like the thing about the eye transplants and it really like weighed on me the concept and like the emotional weight of realizing that at this scheduled point in time, you are going to be getting the tissue for this transplant. And th so that person is out there in the world somewhere and we don't know who it is but they are going to die in in almost certainly some like terrible way between now and this next period of time. And it's such a narrow window of time that you're basically going to know on like within the period of a couple of days, like when it happens, when it comes to that time, like a week before. And in that span, every single night, you can basically think like tonight, someone, that person is going to die probably to give me their uh, ocular tissue, which is, like, that's a lot of emotional burden to carry. It's a very heavy issue, which also, Especially in a way, if you're I was a like, kid. yeah, I kept on thinking, like, from Camilla's perspective, could you imagine someone you've never met coming up to you, telling you they're a fan of your work, and then immediately laying upon you the emotional burden of thinking about a pre-scheduled transplant from someone who hasn't yet died and is almost certainly going to die suddenly and violently? Like I mean, she, I'm thinking about it now. She launches into, like, Camilla's never met her before. She's like, hey, oh, it's so great to meet you. 
I no, the love thing your I games. really like thinking I'm about blind is... and I'm all I'm you know, I'm just thinking a lot lately about like the nature of mortality and the things that we take from those who have died violently. And she get launches into that like three minutes into this conversation with someone she's never met before. Another thing I think is really funny is that she starts us off by saying that she loves Camilla's praying and she loves the fact that she yeah. prays before all the things. What she's doing is literally praying like pestilence and death over her sister. And she's just like, that's such a mood. Yeah, sibling, <laughs> sibling. <laughs> <laughs> and I, she's like yeah i do the exact same thing on every tuesday night and stuff it oh is, yeah okay so it's so funny to as me you, as you alluded also to, i think that she doesn't think about the fact that camilla was just like a hex on you and your family and like this literally is her family talking to camilla well, i mean clearly she knew about that and was just saying that to like you know she was setting up for the slam dunk for wilson later um so, I was blown away by the bonus feature reveal on this um, that Sarah's character, the blind girl in this episode, was inspired by Sarah, the host of the old unofficial AIO podcast. Um, Which we both used to listen to. Yeah, I don't know how many people watching this used to listen to the unofficial podcast. It ended like a decade Forever ago you. at this point. So, it's fairly old. Um but yeah, I used to love that podcast. I listened to every single episode. Um, Sarah talked very frequently and frequent, frankly and frequently in the podcast about her site. And really specifically, a thing that I think about every time I listen to this episode um, is that in the review for A Class Reenactment in Album 50, which is the episode where Edwin is staging the play about the founding of Odyssey with Trent and Mandy and uh, Marvin, that Sarah talked a lot in the review about how she had been thinking and feeling a lot lately that she would never find anyone romantically who would want to take on the burden of her disability. And then right as she was in the thick of that emotional despondency, she heard this episode and how Wolfgang Gower was blinded. And he was like, Bertha, I understand if you leave me behind, I'm just going to hold you back. And she was like, no, I'm going to stick by you. And she held him up and supported him. And it was like, God was speaking directly to Sarah right in this absolute nadir of a moment when she needed the most. And it was just really beautiful and emotional review on their podcast. It's been like probably nine years at least since I listened to that. And I still remember it vividly. So hearing that like Sarah's story was the inspiration for this episode and that that was all being like pulled from her experience was crazy because it was like you know it wasn't just like hearing about some random fan or something it's like this is a person that you know I've never met or talked to Sarah personally but actually you know what I had talked to her before personally on uh, the TOO on the forums back in the day so back 500 years ago yeah So, yeah, that was, that was wild. And it was very cool that given that Sarah's journey and story of, like, dealing with her issues with her sight has been tied in to Adventures in Odyssey already, it's cool that, you know, they were able to specifically, in a targeted way, like, make this episode inspired by and about her and even give the character her name and stuff like that. So it was a pretty cool tribute to her. I don't really have anything to add that you haven't said yet. So yeah, I don't really have much to say about this episode. Honestly, I keep on forgetting what the plot of it is. Like I did the same thing, but that's because I don't understand. So many times. What... It's happened like four times to me. I don't get what the title means still. Like we thought it would be like about like a house divided or about the concept of dividing church and state possibly. Like my only thought is like maybe it's about like dividing like like this is what happens if you divide like the context and prayerful understanding of scripture from like yeah, the but it says text rightly. itself. It makes it sound like it's a good thing. Yeah, I know. So that's why I'm like, I don't, I don't know. 
Should be called wrongly dividing filth. I'm kidding. I don't know. I'm sure someone else knows and will tell us in the comments. So that's why I keep on forgetting. Then the thing I remember is like, this is one about using the Bible bat. The only thing I remember the is that Sarah's bat. in it. And like, that's it. I keep on remembering it's about using the Bible bat. That's the connection between the two storylines. See, the thing that's confusing me is the playbook episode, which is two episodes from now in this album. It's also a sports episode. And like, you can't have two sports episodes in the you can't same smother album. smother us I, like that especially if it's a six episode album i won't know which episode's which it's bad enough to have any sports episodes <laughs> i don't understand sports i like saying sports things wrong on purpose because it because um, it's funny because it's funny except for then my dad thinks that he i'm serious and he tries to correct me i'm, I'm watching him play hot like he's watching hockey and i'm like oh yes i like it when the quarterback pitches the ball and he's just like actually it's i'm like never mind <laughs> he leaves the room. oh dad yeah i i don't i haven't said anything that stupid but i have said something okay i was gonna say there's no i would be very disappointed in our father if he could not no. tell that that was hyperbole no i think i called uh like a called it a touchdown or, or something like that I think I called, like, yeah, a home run, a touchdown, or something like that once. Uh -huh. And he was like, that's not what it's called. And I was like, yeah, I know that's not what it's called. And I called, uh, uh, my, I know what they're called, but my mind is blanking. The person who stands behind, umpire. Not the referee, but the person who, like, catches the ball. The umpire. If you miss it, thank you, the umpire. I called them a, what did I call them? I think I called that person, like, a quarterback once, or something like that. <laughs> It was like when I was like I was with dad in Costco somewhere and I was like I was wearing my free jacket and I was like look at me wearing this sports jacket aren't you proud of me isn't this what you always wanted and he was like this doesn't count. <laughs> anyway I don't really think we have much to say about that. Yeah no. I don't really have much to say at all. I thought it was a okay episode. I definitely preferred um, Camilla's plot yeah. over the plot with that kid whose name we can't remember can you tell that one was more impactful to us than the well, other well i mean i, do I think like Lou a lot though i think on one side there's the fact that it's like you know the one with sarah is a lot more dramatic and it was also like inspired by real life and stuff and like the that. other one's a golden rule storyline which like all golden rule storylines we've are more or less the yeah same. it's the fact that we've done that specific verse before multiple times yeah i feel like every single time someone does an episode of literally anything about the golden rule it's always about someone twisting it yeah and that's it and that's the whole storyline and then at the end they're like oh i shouldn't have done that and that's, that's it's like thing. it always ends with like oh i guess i need to treat them the way i want to be treated even if they don't treat me the way i want to be treated and it always ends the exact same way and yeah, that's why that I didn't really care as much because I was listening to it and I was like, yep, I already know where this is going to go. I did like the part at the end, though, with the other bully who was just like, eh, you're okay. And then he like kept going. And I was like, I yeah, like, like I mean, I'm really glad that we're like I said, that we're getting more like neurodivergent characters and that even exploring the same plot line with them reveals like different thought processes about how to like kind of understand scripture and stuff which is important because the people who listen to this show are equally diverse and are going to have different ways of looking at things and so the more different ways we can look at things in the show the more kind of examples that it gives for the different people who are listening to it and that's you know one of the many reasons why diversity in our casts are so important um, so I'm really glad that we have that. I just felt like in this particular instance of storytelling that it had been somewhere that we had tread that ground enough before that it didn't live up to the really good stuff that they were able to pull off with Camilla's side. I also felt like the example, like not only the Golden Rule stuff had been played out before, but the stuff that Camilla was doing felt so particularly relevant to what is happening in the world right now, especially like I thought really specifically of like all the immigration stuff in the u.s right now but generally it can apply to a lot of things in terms of like you know 
using scripture to bash people because you're just taking and using it as a tool to like rile people up. It makes me think of what we always talk about like with the the book of Eli also having a great message about like bad people trying to take scripture to use it as a tool to manipulate people against other people. <laughs> so yeah. Sorry, I didn't really say anything about this episode. I thought it was okay. I yeah. just don't really have anything to say about it. Um, I don't know what to give it. I think I'm going to give it like a three. I'm going to give it a 4.1 because I feel like the Camilla and Sarah and Wilson side of the story was quite strong. Yeah, basically my three points and I was were that. really glad that they brought back Lou's character. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like her storyline was already ground too familiar, familiarly tread previously. Yeah, like I'm giving it automatic two and a half for Camilla's storyline because I thought it was great. But since like literally half the episode is basically just the stuff with Lou. Mm-hmm. I'm going to count that as like the other 50%. Yeah, and then 0.5 is Lou coming back. Because I like Lou. But I don't know. I think certain parts of this episode were kind of forgettable. Which is kind of unfortunate. <laughs> kind of. I Camilla would say stuff. very much so given yeah, for you. Because the, you literally did multiple times over. Yeah. The Camilla stuff is really, really good. But yeah. 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 That's a valid way of looking at it mathematically. I'm going to rejig to 3.8. So, that is our album premiere, Brightly Dividing. Um, and then next we're moving on to the second episode, which is Man of the House. And smash cut. There. Seamless time transition. Mm -hmm. When, actually, you know what? I'm going to check because I don't remember. I want to see when we filmed the first half of this episode. It was... 170. Okay, so this is called Man of the House. It's That can't be. We filmed this in August? In I feel like it was earlier than that. August 5th, Victoria. We filmed this a decade ago. It's January. <laughs> yep. We're just so prepared. Episode, we filmed it that long ago. Episode 875. And now we're moving onwards. Who Epis wrote it? Episode 875, Man in the House, written by Marshall Younger. Are you crying? No. I'm just surprised. I don't believe you. Uh, what happened since this episode? Uh, can you recap it? I've done a lot of talking today at Children's Church. Okay. So, um, Wyatt. His dad, as we know previously, um, he's back already. That was like, whoa, that was fast. Getting a lot of Wyatt all of a sudden. Um, he, I like Wyatt. His dad is in the military overseas, and his dad was like, you need to be the man of the house. So Wyatt is doing all these things to try and like take on undue responsibilities that he doesn't know how to do. And Matthew sees that and feels jealous of it, so he tries to do the same thing. And then when he tells... David about it. David's like, it's time for me to take y'all out behind the woodshed into the woods and kill you. It, teach you how to be men, um, which involves mostly unironic, physically strenuous tasks. And because that's what being a man is. And so he does that a lot until they realize that Wyatt is completely psychologically broken inside and out. You're really old for your age. Thanks. It's the trauma. Yeah. Um, and then there, David was like, whoopsie doodle, maybe this wasn't a good idea. And then maybe explains to them a, a more, you know, a more accurate representation of masculinity than what David was trying to teach them. And then it's all okay. And he like helps him try to, you know, figure out what he actually needs to be doing to help support his mom instead of trying to bear the undue weights of these patriarchal ideas. This so, episode 
Wyatt is very Grady esque, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's, he has been. This felt like as a Grady said. episode to me. In fact, there is a Grady episode like this, which mm. I think handled certain things a little better. I do think this one's different from that one, even though they do kind of still have. Like, uh, you're the man of the house. You're yeah. in charge. Oh, I'm going to do things that go badly for everyone. Kind yeah. Of thing. So Wyatt wants to be, like, fixing the plumbing and the electricity, all these things he doesn't know how to do. He asked Matthew for a, a propane torch from David. He was like, is your dad one of those people who thinks that propane torches are dangerous in the hands of the children? Wyatt, I have the perfect friend and resource for you. Eugene. And his name is Eugene Meltzer. <laughs> Gee, Buck, why does your dad let you play with two axes? Chainsaws. Two chainsaws. Wit is the one who lets you play with two axes. Are you done season one of The Mandalorian? Yeah, I finished it with mom and dad Okay. while they were here. Oh, right, I forgot about that. Okay, Mandalorian spoilers for quick men. Um, okay, I'll, I'll put it on the, the bottom of the screen here. It'll go away when they're over. Uh, characters officially saying they're adopted is just, like, my, my thing. They're getting adopted by dads, like, thinking about Buck being taken care of, Eugene. Like, I could see Mando just giving Baby Yoda, like, a torch and letting him run wild. And people being like, don't do that to your son! And he was just like, he's fine. He's part of the crew. Divided this we, is the way. Divided we fall. Definitely. I could see Baby Yoda and Mando. Maybe Yoda getting his own jetpack because he weighs yeah. okay. less we than need a to, grape. We need to just... cut it so that we people can yeah. listen again if they haven't seen Mandalorian. Okay. okay. Anyways, um, so we hear Go that watch the Mandalorian is really good. We hear that Lucia has been cutting hair. So assuming this episode takes place chronologically through the episode numbers with the AIOC, which was an issue with Swept Away and the Penny and Wooten's honeymoon before. So who knows? Um, but if it is after then that means that Lucia's treatments went well enough with her cancer that she's cutting hair again. So that's a good sign. Well, they said or that they should have been going well. I know, but, you know, you never know. Um, I don't remember the context of this line because it's been a while. Um, but I assume Wyatt... Maybe not why. That doesn't really make sense. Probably David says, that's a felony. And Matthew says, only if they prosecute. I like Matthew's gumption. He knows what's up. Um, this episode, so yeah, with Lucia and the haircutting, everyone keeps on piling on about Matthew's hair in this episode and criticizing it. And I This was, isn't the first time that's happened to him. No, there was the episode where they're like, oh, it's so long. But I was really like, because they're like, oh, you got a crooked haircut. And everyone keeps commenting on it and pointing I it have, out. I haven't got a dent in my head. Yeah, I was really upset about this. What's wrong with everyone? That is not how you treat your child, your son, by a mile repeatedly criticizing their physical appearance. Do you know how fast your kid is going to be scarred or embarrassed to talk to you or ashamed of how they look when their parent is treating them like this? Can't you just get a different haircut if they're all teasing him about his haircut? His grandma's the one who cut his hair in the first place. I was like, I was very upset about that the the felony line um i started watching owl house the other day you really need to watch the first episode it's super good there was one line uh where a character who was like a wanted poster of them was captured by like the captain of the guard or whatever and he was like you're gonna go to jail and she was like i haven't done anything illegal that you know of or was caught for why do i have wanted posters well like, oh. you got me there <laughs> it, was, it was a good line um this episode uh definitely carries a lot of lawrence hodges feels for wyatt that's that's what i was thinking of it like, was I, I could definitely super um, our like, father yeah 100 percent. see what you mean me when of. you're talking about like camp in a hard yeah. place like the parallels between this and our father was enormous i was thinking like this is like a worse version of our father or lots of grainy, like, subplots. Um, so everything with Wyatt comes like to three, a head. Like, three o'clock call? What was yeah. it? That's Is that it. what it's called? Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, everything with Wyatt comes to a head when 
George, I was going to say George and Jimmy, when David and Matthew get up in the middle of the night and they're like, what's that? And it's Wyatt trying to start a fire with rocks and his hands are bleeding, quote, a lot from how long he's been trying it. Not just uh-huh. bleeding, but they're bleeding a lot. Uh-huh. No, Wyatt. No, David. David, David. Okay, so the theme of this episode, I was so confused about what message this episode was trying to send because I kept on being so, like, turned around by what I was expecting in terms of thematic subversion. In terms of all the, like, gender-centric machismo in this episode, it was a roller coaster. Based on the episode title, I was dreading the worst, which is this episode would be centered around a lot of archaic, macho, toxic masculinity ideas about manhood being connected to being the breadwinner and fixing your appliances and bottling down all your emotions deep inside until one day you die. Um, Not that extreme, but, you know. And then up until the camping trip idea, I was, like, feeling really good about things then. Wyatt was feeling the pressure to help provide for his mother beyond his abilities because of his father's absence, and Matthew's pride as the genius inventor was being hurt by younger Wyatt's self-assigned responsibilities. There's nothing necessarily gendered here. The episode title is purely, like, idiomatic. Man of the house, like, the person who's looking after things. Um, there was nothing that was had to actually do with, like, being a man. It was more about, like, looking after people and about Matthew's pride being hurt. Um, and then David comes in with his camping plan, And then we're back to square one. And David has them, like, lifting logs on your head and carrying rocks in your backpack like you're training on Dagobah. And then maybe halfway through this sequence, suddenly it becomes so obvious to me that all these lessons David's doing are so... They're too comically brutish and stereotypical. This is all a lesson to teach Matthew that being a man isn't about fixing appliances and being able to heft logs over your head, but it's about being caring and mindful and supportive and studious and the other things that make up a generally good person, regardless of gender. It was shortly after this that, like, it became so obvious here, like, oh, yeah, I see David's, like, trying to get them all, and they're like, oh, I can't do all these physically strenuous tasks. And it's like, that's not what being a man is. It's, you know, being a good person and stuff. Um, And it was shortly after this became so obviously clear to me that, once again, this was not the case. David's rite of passage lessons were actually about lifting logs and having bugs in your hair and carrying rocks in your backpack. And the point wasn't, this isn't what it means to be a man. It was, you don't need to be this now, but you will later, I guess. And Wyatt basically got the same talk from his dad um, to a lesserly weird degree than David Shtick was, but still a little bit. So, um, Man, I would have liked that a lot more if David... Did that it, that, it seems so much like that's happen. what it was leading up to, and then it was like, "Oh no, this was unironic." But maybe you were just a little. I too think young when I originally right, listened to this right episode, rock lifting, uh, I thought something kind of along those lines was going to happen. So I was like, "Point being, I'll just be over here listening to for better or for worse on repeat as Wit helps Eugene deconstruct gender roles and expectations in his life and marriage relationship." It's a good episode. It is. Um. Yeah, this episode really reminded me of our father. Like, um, Wyatt is in a really, really similar situation that he's basically just Lawrence with like a non hyperactive imagination. Yeah. And after the last scene of the episode, like at the end, everyone's happy. They're in the garage working on this putting green. And David's like, Yeah, we thought it would be a great father son activity because we get to use all these manly tools. And I was like, It's just, I don't know, it's a weird place to leave the episode, like to build up all episode that Matthew and Wyatt are getting themselves in trouble and Wyatt working until his hands bleed profusely trying to live up to this societally pushed idea of what he thinks being a man means. And then David takes them on a trip to show them what it really means and he's basically like, yep, you got it, that was all correct. It is about lifting heavy things and using power tools. Good GG guys, you got it. And that's it. And that's, and that's a that's really the good end. thing like, that David's been uh, his evil doppelganger for the past couple of <laughs> Yeah, it's just weird. Like, not only has this show done great deconstructions of the topic before, but the narrative here felt so well set up, so obviously well set up to do the opposite of what it was and logically should have been instead of what it was. And that's the thing that gets to me the most. Is like, not only is it bad thematically but it was set up perfectly to be good and then it just 
didn't do that and it was like, nope, you got it. There's no plot twist here. It is face value, yes. Right? And doesn't that seem damaging how it's like Matthew and Wyatt are both like, especially the scene with like Wyatt up in the middle of the night, like frantically pushing himself until he's bleeding over all this stuff because yeah. he has these like ideas of this is what I have to live up to and it's driving him to physical self-harm and the whole point of David's thing is like, yeah, that is it. Yeah, that this is what being a man is about. You're right, Wyatt. Let me show you my rock scars. Wyatt gets a kid when he's older, and he's just like, oh no, where are my rocks? And he runs off into the forest, never to be seen again. I was just so surprised that it was like, yeah, no, that was the point. Like, it's, it was so narratively constructed well for it to have been an object lesson where David was like, see, this isn't what this isn't what it means. Be a good person. And you don't need to be able to lift logs over your head. You know what it's time for? I am Boo Boo the Fool. <sighs> Bo -bo Bobo? It's Boo Boo. Boo Boo? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I was, I was shocked, honestly, by it. Because I was like, I know what's happening here. <laughs> and this was what I was expecting no at the beginning. Twist? Like I said, I was like dreading at the beginning. I was like, okay, this, this is going all right. And then I was like, Ugh, no. And then I was like, ah, I see what's going on here. This is pretty well done. And I was like, nope, okay, never mind. That was that was my uh, emotional journey watching Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> um. So yeah, that's about all I have to say about this episode i don't have that much to say i feel like they've done this episode better in the past yeah i'm gonna give this, it this suffers what from what like a lot of episodes since the hiatus suffer from and honestly not even just post hiatus episodes episodes like around novacom's time and even like in the teen albums were like this too Honestly, throughout all of Odyssey, there's always been a problem of every now and then they make an episode that's too similar to another episode, and the only difference is it's a worse version of it. But this isn't even like, oh, we did the same lesson, but it's worse. It's like, we did it, and then we just made it opposite. Yeah. Bad, like, lesson-wise. Who wrote this one again? Confounding. Uh, Marshall. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's, it's strange. Um, I'm... I think I'm going to give it a 1.3 out of 5 because I'm just really unhappy with like the story and theme construction. I, I like give it a, I like that why it was a here. One. It's been it could have been better. I like that why it was here and there were some good lines. I like why overall I just thought the theme was like really it's not even that it was poorly executed. It was a bad theme. I like uh, the one is for Wyatt being a good precious boy. And for nothing else. So. You look sad. Yeah, that's that's all I got for this one. Um, so what episodes are we talking about next time, Victoria? Next time, I think we have some more we, positive notes. Do we know? Is it still this album? It's this album. Yeah, all through. Okay. Um, next time, then, it's going to be a page from the playbook. Correct. And... I just listened to it. A sacrificial I escape. The what? A sacrificial escape. Yeah, that. I just listened to it and like can't even remember what it's called. And if you haven't heard these episodes yet, which I imagine you have because they came out six months ago now that we're finally recording we this. Are so you've literally, probably... Devin's blessed. literally the last person to hear a sacrificial escape. I have it wasn't, been... It wasn't... What I was expecting from I have the episode. Been asking him I will. for like seven months now if he's heard it yet. We'll and now he's about finally it. listened to we'll it. We'll talk about so. it next time. Yep. Until then, thank you for joining us on our side of the YouTube. I've been Devin Francis, also known as Leonard Meltzner. And bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>